Hello and welcome back and that's right today we want to continue with our series of videos on building your own NAS and frankly this is the video in the series that's either going to please a lot of you or absolutely hack a lot of you off. This is five things that people always forget, overlook or ignore when specking up their new DIY server. But before we go any further a few disclaimers. Number one this video is about building a server it's about building either a desktop or in some cases a rack mount server this is not really suitable as a video for building a pc from scratch for windows or any other os because a lot of things are incredibly server specific secondly i've already done a few videos on either diy servers or os free uh, nas servers in the market such as this one the cwwk io um, aoi 6t six bay there and of course the john spo that we've banged on about the channel for a while and some of the things i'm going to talk about today are counter to particularly that john spo video but the reason being was the remit of those videos was to get the device under a certain price point and most of the things i'm going to talk about today when i say they're the things that people don't do most of the time it's because people are saving the old wonga so with regards to those jumbos the reason that uh, the jumbo video was like that was because we were trying to get it a uh, not dissimilar spec to certain turnkey nas solutions so again before any of you go to the comments and go well you didn't do that in your video that's why and we stated as such in that video but let's crack on with number one This is one that gets overlooked really, really easily. And I would argue of all the points I'm going to talk about in today's video, it's the one that seems the most obvious the more you think about it. It's to do with SATA connections. When you're running a NAS server, unless you're going to go top, top spec, go fabric, go NVMe, or basically go full flash, chances are you're going to be occupying a bunch of bays with SATA hard drives. You might have some M2 NVMEs or some SATA SSDs banged inside the panels, but the majority of that storage, the long term, your warm, your cold storage, is going to be hard drive based and each one of those bays needs to be connected on SATA or SAS if you're going high end. The problem is when you look at the motherboards that go inside a lot of these solutions and that's if you're not just going to buy a standard you know PC case and turn it into um, a server they don't have a lot of SATA connectors on the motherboards there. Indeed, when you're looking at a lot of these um, kind of OS3 ready-to-go solutions in some cases, or, you know, like the CWWK there, or building your own and you're limited to um, ITX motherboards in most cases because of that compact nature of the chassis, getting one that's got more than about four SATA, maybe five SATA ports on it are actually quite hard to come by and you might go and get yourself a motherboard with a decent little spec cpu on there you know support of a decent amount of memory and it's going to fit neatly inside the case that you want to buy and then you go to connect all the drives and realize you've only got four sata connectors and once you realize you also need one drive in many cases with things like TrueNAS to be an os drive you're down another one now of course if you're using m2 nvmes you're fine for that but you still need sata connectors otherwise you're going to be limited on the number of bays now there's going to be some of you putting in the comments already or at least shouting at me, uh, SATA bridge cards, uh, utilizing a PCIe RAID card or standard upgrade SATA card. And you're right. Those are options that are open to you. However, if you use the PCIe, that means you're losing a PCIe slot to SATA drives. You're not even utilizing it to bang in your 10 GB or 20 GB. You're not using it for a decent graphics card. You're not using it for M2 NVMe speedy bays. You're using a PCIe potentially times three times 16 slot or even times four times 16 slot for SATA hard drives, which is insanity. Now, maybe you were gonna buy a RAID card anyway with a SAS fan out, fine, good for you. But the rest of you who aren't gonna do that are going for more con, you know, you know concise can smaller builds you're going to need those SATA bays now if you go for the bridging card something i talked about in my um th uh, three recommended uh, john's bow builds video for 250 500 and 750 dollars or there or thereabouts you'll see that i talked about that little SATA bridge there it has a main SATA connector going into it and power delivered from the psu and it goes out into five individual SATA outputs there that's great right you can add five drives right well you can but remember all five of those drives are going to be sharing a SATA port just because you're connected into a SATA port on the MOBO you've only got six gigabit or around you know 600 or so megabytes per second to share across those drives now your average SATA hard drive is only going to give you 
you know, two, 250 megs normal. So you're only really going to have the saturation there for two or maybe three regular class drives. So do bear in mind that using those little bridging boards, SATA bridge boards, will reduce the available uh, bandwidth for those connected drives. And using a PCIe card upgrade means you're losing a PCIe slot that you may otherwise have wanted to use more effectively. However, another reason this is on the table is there is a third option which might not please everyone, but I would argue will please some users. Sorry for the noise there. Because this employs a slightly more recently adapted uh, alternative, this here. Now, if I bring that close to the camera, can you see all of those little SATA connectors? They are connected to an M2 NVMe that's going in a Gen 3 times one or Gen 3 times two M2 slot. That little adapter will set you back $10, $15, and it allows you to attach a rack of up to six SATA connectors there. And there is more than enough bandwidth on that PCIe to fully saturate each one of those drives in the right rate configuration. Now, as good as that sounds, much like the PCIe card, you're gonna lose an M2. Now, in the case of this little micro ITX, that board there has got two M2 slots inside there, so I'm not losing it. But if you're looking at a motherboard that's got two M2 NVMe slots, and you're already gonna use one for an OS drive, and you weren't gonna do like a mirrored RAID or use it as a cache disk, that does allow you to maybe utilize that, PCI, uh, that PCIe M2 NVMe slot to get around the lack of SATA ports that may be on your motherboard. I would say of all of the comments that I got were a bit critical on my John's Bow videos, the one that was the more recurrent of any other was my choice of PSU. Now my choice of PSU for a few different reasons did rub some users up the wrong way while I was trying to keep things under a budget. And as I stated in that video, I went for that budget option to stay on budget. But personally, that is not the PSU I would have gone for for different reasons. Now one of the recurring things people mentioned is that this PSU is upside down on this build. Now that was an intentional choice the reason it's facing the wrong way is because the main atx um itx connector i should say the 20 pin connector that goes into the motherboard was an incredibly short cable when you look at cheaper psus the cabling they include is often very short i don't know whether it's their count in every single cent i'm not sure but the result is that even in a compact case like this that has that psu compartment i needed to rotate the psu to give myself that extra it's just shy of two inches to get that um, 20 pin connector inside the top mounted mobo there it's an incredibly tight one but more on from that it was about the actual psu itself it was some off-brand aliexpress 250 watt metal junker and again not a great psu choice but if you're looking to save money there are options out there but what is the cost well the cost of cheap psus is actually felt in several different ways. The first way is consistent power use. So sometimes you see PSUs, cheaper ones like that one, that will have a reported 250 watt, but they can't sustain that. Now you might not be cramming 250 watts at any given time, because bear in mind, whether you go for a 1000 watt PSU or a, 200 watt, a 250 watt PSU, if you're only drawing 200 watts, the two PSUs, you're not using any more power in theory, more on that in a moment. But, it's the consistency of that power across the system that's really, really important. And the other thing is efficiency. Because PSU efficiency, particularly in 24-7 servers, is paramount. Now, efficiency stems from different things. Number one, when you are drawing power from a PSU, PSU, uh, the, the way PSU uh, draws power is not 100% efficient. You're always losing some of that power in the form of heat during the transfer. But the bigger the PSU, the bigger potential for that loss. So if you go for a big, big PSU, a big, you know, 750 watt unbranded inefficient PSU, 
you're actually losing a decent whack of power. And ultimately, in a 24-7 server, that all adds up. Particularly if, you know, like most of Europe right now, you are really feeling the old energy cost there. Now, some PSUs, more expensive ones, will arrive with a rating on the side that says 80 plus, and it will have gold or silver or bronze, or going all the way up to platinum and titanium. What that is to do with is they are rated the most efficient PSUs in the market. That means you keep at least 80% of that power and as you go through the grading systems all the way up to titanium it gets even more efficient and the, the the amount of power lost to heat becomes lower and lower needless to say the higher that rating the more expensive the psu is but ultimately if you're going to be running the server 24 7 for years upon years upon years those numbers will add up and hopefully hopefully depending on your usage idle versus active will end up making up that deficit between the price difference between them and with more efficient PSUs are losing more power to that inefficiency there. Another thing I mentioned with regards to the cabling, when I did that cable the wrong way up because we went with a cheap one, when you start going towards more efficient uh, PSUs, that is also where you start to find clip-on uh, PSUs. These are ones that rather than have the cables pre-attached, they are ones where you have inserts to attach the cables and then wire it in more efficient, efficiently there. That actually gets around that issue of having shorter PSU cables or cheaply made PSU cables. The last thing before we leave the subject of PSUs I will touch on is much like I mentioned with the SATA connectors, you've got to check that you've got the right amount of Molex. Molex sounds really really silly but Molex such an old style connector. In terms of building your own NAS server, you tend to find that the backplane, the SATA board, because most of these systems have one singular board that's being utilized with the CPU and the memory on it, and another board that all of your hard drives are connected into, that SATA board needs power. You can have those cables connecting it, as mentioned earlier, into the motherboard, but it needs power too. And in most cases, these off-branded card, um, off-branded SATA boards that all your drives are connected into with their trays, are connected with Molex and a Molex connector you tend to find for every grouping of three to four drives you get one Molex connector so the more drives you have the more Molex connectors for power going in and cheaper PSUs have fewer Molex connectors on them you can get little adapters that can be attached to singular Molexes to fan them out but you're still then sharing that power bandwidth or connectors that you can attach to the SATAs which can then go into the Molexes to power the drives but nevertheless you're still talking about a finite number of cables and that's just another way in which getting a more power efficient CP, uh, PSU with connectors you can buy manually and attach to it allows you to be more selective about the SATA, the Molex and the board adapters length and quality that you're going to need. Yes, it will cost you more, but in the long term, it might bring you that money back. Next up, we've got to talk about cooling and heat efficiency on these devices. And by the way, the irony that this is one of the seven days of the year in the UK that we actually have some sun and I'm sweating like a pig here, the irony is not lost on me. But when it comes to 24-7 servers, cooling and heat efficiency and the maintenance of that uh, temperature inside and cooling events is really, really important. Why is that? Well, and it's very base level. If a system is overheating, the components inside, predominantly the CPU, the memory to a lesser extent, but certainly some of the storage, may throttle itself to stop it damaging itself for overuse. It will reduce its performance in a number of key different ways, depending on the component, if temperatures go too high. On top of that, not only will you see a dip in performance and potential long-term degradation on the components, but on top of that, the fans inside and the cooling will now will improve and increase to compensate against that heat. So you end up with a double barrel problem. You've got components that are getting too hot and you have a system that is becoming noisier and consuming more power as it is increasing um, heat, uh, active ventilation on the system with fans to push that warm air out of all of the passive ventilation of those vents. So maintaining lots of ventilation throughout the system either passing through the system or having the fans in strategic locations is going to be crucial now depending on the case you're looking at you may be limited in your options what do i mean by that well at the moment we're working on our johnsbow n3 build here on the channel in the background 
But one of the main differences we spotted very early doors between the John's Bow N2 and the John's Bow N3 was here. It was the height afforded to the motherboard. They're both utilizing um, uh, uh, ITX motherboards inside, but the newer N3 has a taller compartment. That allows you to take advantage of much better heat sinks and CPU fans inside. Now you can get smaller form factor uh, CPU heat sinks and fans there, but in order to maintain a decent level of heat dissipation, they'll have a great deal more uh, fans on them. They'll have a uh, copper piping throughout, which will increase the price, but it needs that to be able to express and release all of that heat into the air that it's pulling from the CPU as much as possible in that confined space, and that will increase the pricing. There are ways you can use strategically placed copper piping around systems to draw that heat from the mobile and then release it into the air as the passive cooling goes through it, but once again, you've got to be mindful of airflow through the systems. Having, for example, that mobile at the top underneath that vent fan and going, oh, well, there's a fan there, that's fine. If there's no way for active air to pass through this system over the components, over the heat sinks inside, and through the um, fans inside to continue that airflow throughout the case, then that vent's not going to do very much because that air's not going anywhere. The heat sink has got all of those vents for the air to pass through, but if the air ain't pa passing through it, heat is rising, of course, but it's still only going to work to that limited capacity. And it may just go into the heat panel, which again, then you're overly reliant on the dissipation of a metal top base panel there. The same goes for when you're looking at drives. Again, if you don't have sufficient spacing between drives or ventilation there on the front, or if you don't even have that to allow air to pass through the front panel, that warm air ain't going anywhere. And if anything, it's being reabsorbed into the surrounding area, thereby actually making things consistently worse. And again, when it comes to the fans, then as those fans get up, you're starting to hear it right now. And it'll get super annoying if you're in close proximity to these devices. So cooling, heat dissipation, and just strategic vent placement and areas inside for the air to flow is paramount. So just keep that in mind. Another way in which you can lower the heat being generated inside your system and open up airflow is, of course, going for external PSUs. Now, it's not for everyone. There's a lot of users out there that do not like having external PSUs that they've connected into their system and are just waiting for the day that them or the dog walk by and accidentally disconnect their server, therefore killing it on the spot. Now, I get that. There's lots of reasons. But me personally, I think there is a place for external PSUs. I talked about it several times on the channel in NAS videos, in that Storaxa video, that having an external PSU is about 150,000 times easier to replace. They're not as efficient, I will say, as an internal PSU, but it means you are removing something that's generating heat from inside this chassis and making it a lot easier to replace. Now you can buy pre-made NAS chassis that have external PSUs and these will arrive, as you can see at the top, with a little bridging board inside that feeds into the connector that this is being connected into and it separates the power across the inside. It makes it a little bit more of a complex um, exercise and much like we mentioned in the PSU section, doing that will result in lower efficiency by the PSU and what's being drawn, but still nonetheless, when it comes to freeing up airflow inside your system, going for more compact systems, or removing the heat source that a PSU can generate inside, compared with this one, which has got that big old PSU inside, it is something of a game changer. And if you're worried about airflow, that is a good way to go. Next up, let's talk about getting the CPU choice right first time. Now, if you're looking at CPUs for a server, I think it'd be fair to say that a number of you, you've been out of the CPU game for a while. I know I was. And it's very easy to go, well, that's an i5. It must be good. i5s have now been around for so long that the term i5 just isn't enough. And you've got to break it down into generations. Also, new naming strategies that Intel have rolled out with a number of their you know, high-profile CPUs, the elimination of the Celeron and Pentium range uh, early in 2023, late 2022, have all added up to the landscape of PS uh, of CPUs being very, very tough to follow. But let's take some baby steps. First and foremost, when you're putting a CPU inside these devices, along with the mobile that you choose to go with, bear in mind that those CPUs, two important factors you're gonna have to consider, and there are many others, is 
uh, PCI lanes and the number of them. Now, hard drives inside NAS servers, you will end up using some lanes for these pairing of these drives. The same goes if you're going to be utilizing uh, the uh, PCIe slot on the motherboard to take advantage again of M2 NVMEs, newer generation M2 NVMEs at Gen 4, so you have to get newer CPUs. Indeed, there are just so many factors to put in when it comes to both the PCI lanes and the number of those lanes when building from, because that ultimately that's the landscape you're building within. You can't exceed those two things. Now, when it comes to the gen of gen three, that's a uh, thousand megs per second per lane, gen four, which is 2000 megs per second per lane, and gen five, which is 4000 megs per second per lane, that's a lot of bandwidth to play with there. You're still gonna need the rest of the components to fill it, but the newer generation CPUs will have a newer, gen, a newer gen of PCIe architecture to play with there. So if you're worried about limitations of scope with the devices you're connecting inside, particularly if you've got multiple PCIe cards or intend to lean a lot more on M2 NVMEs, go for Gen 4 or Gen 5 CPUs. It will cost you more, but there's more room to grow within them. Another thing to bear in mind with CPUs to do with integrated graphics. A lot of CPUs arrive with uh, an onboard component to handle graphics. And if you're gonna not have a PCIe graphics card installed inside your system and you want to interface with it directly, you're gonna need a CPU with integrated graphics on board. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to see the content of the system locally. You'll still be able to access it on the network. So if you're running uh, a true NAS build or an Unraid build and you've already got your boot media sorted and therefore you don't need to KVM, keyboard video mouse, into it, then it's not a problem. But just bear in mind that CPUs that don't have integrated graphics will not allow you to keyboard video mouse into it directly. You'll only be able to do it from the network and you'll have to make sure that your system is already pre-configured in order for it to appear on the network. Integrated graphics, of course, is defined in lots of different ways. If you look at modern generation Intel Core, particularly 11th, 12th or 13th gen, these are the ones, if you want that serious bandwidth I discussed, um, you will often see um, uh, a prefix at the end of K or F. Now K means it's got integrated graphics. It means you've got that onboard graphical component that only allows you to directly interface with it, but it will also have a portion of the CPU that is it's precisely designed to deal with graphical data and it will use less power to handle that data conversions transcoding visual data cad editing anything like that or you know for gameplay not really equivalent to uh, piece, piece, uh server building but that integrated graphics is better designed than using the rest of the cpu which will use raw power to get the job done and use more power to get the job done overheat and just generally be nowhere near as good as integrated graphics now a cpu uh, that has f on board that means there is no integrated graphics f having no integrated graphics means not only can you not directly interface with it but if you're running graphical tasks you're going to use more power while getting it done now again you can get around it you can install a graphics card into an available pcie slot if you choose to there's also some low profile stuff that you can install via m2 but again these are really expensive not very very efficient ultimately if you're not going to plan on directly kvm it's not a problem for you plus um f-series cpus can uh, be overclocked quite substantially now there are cpus out there that that are both F and K together, or KF CPUs, they don't have integrated graphics either, but they do give the option of having um, the higher number of cores afforded to them and that overclocking option. Now, on the subject of cores, let's talk about that. Again, if you've been out of the CPU game for a while and you saw a CPU that was eight cores, four cores, whatever, you know, in the old days, that was fine, but now cores have become far more nuanced and traditionally in more modern cpus you now find um e cores and p cores now p cores are uh, are power cores they are the cores that are designed for raw uses they are front end system use and again you generally find those on the more powerful cpus and the integrated graphics ones e cores are more efficient cpus and they're the ones that's going to run the background stuff now your os and the system you're running will have to be smart enough and compatible to understand the difference and use these more efficiently as they go, much like in the old days of hybrid drives, understanding the difference between solid state and uh, mechanical. But still nonetheless, knowing the difference between those cores will mean that when you see a 16 core CPU and you dig in and then find out it's eight plus eight, 
efficiency and power, you need to know whether you're going to be able to leverage those performance benefits of either of them and ultimately whether you know that CPU is going to be better for you than a CPU with fewer cores but they're all power cores. And finally, something I didn't really go into enough detail on on my previous videos on the Johnsvo and the CWWK this year, and that is to do with these motherboards you can buy that arrive with the CPU, the CPU fan, and the RAM already pre-installed. Now, you may not be aware, this has become pretty lucrative these days. We're finding more and more CPUs and motherboard combos arriving on the scene from single warranty manufacturers there. There's even companies like ones here in the UK, um, again there should be one linked in the description that I'm going to be talking about in a future video, where they have combined CPU, MOBO and memory all on one board ready to rock. If you look at AliExpress, you look at eBay, there's lots of them out there where these are motherboards that have got CPU pre-attached, they've got the memory included and everything's good to go. You don't have to get any um, silicon gel on the fingertips at all however one and this may not come as a big surprise they work out costing more if you buy all of those components independently and you know put it together yourself you will save money it's more hassle there's always the risk of oh my god i bent one of those pins on the ps on the cpu and making sure you get the real right lga 1700 cpu with your lga motherboard support and getting the socket correct and getting the right heatsink on board but you can save a decent amount of money there but the other thing that really 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 gets overlooked is getting a motherboard that fits inside these cases now it's hard enough that you've had to get a cpu that's compatible with the motherboard it's hard enough that you've had to get a psu that is compatible with both the motherboard and fitting inside that case but when you find out that you have to get a motherboard of a very specific size out there then it can be a real headache now as more and more um, pre-made NAS server chassis are rolling out these days, again, on the AliExpress and your eBay and stuff like that and your Amazon, and we're seeing this big gap opening between Turnkey, Synology, QNAP, etc., and uh, DIY, TrueNAS, Unraid. We've got this middle ground of people buying pre-made solutions and putting their own OS of choice in the middle. In this middle ground, we're seeing more and more ready-to-rock NAS cases straight off the shelf be available to buy. But most of them either do a very poor job of telling you the motherboard that you can use or they're too general. So for example, the Jonesbow supports ITX. It's great, right? There's a lot of ITX boards in the market and a lot of M ITX, there's standard ITX and you've got the, there's mini and there's micro ATX. This, for example, utilizes a micro one. So a micro board, by far the smallest, sorry about that screechy noise, it's quite close to the mic, and the board inside this is absolutely freaking tiny. It's normally used inside little uh, router boxes there. Again, for PFSense, it is by far the tiniest card. Now, the one inside this is utilizing um, an MITX board, which is bigger and has a PCIe slot. Again, you can find it on the video that I talked about before. This seems to be the board, the MITX, that's comparable with most NAS cases i've seen on the market <clears throat> and if you look towards even uh, rack mount chassis design the small cavity they afford for the mobo to go inside they generally all still err towards an mitx motherboard inside now there is one exception to the rule and that is to do with something called dtx motherboards now these are more gamer focused. They are stylized on the MITX design of motherboards, but these are the ones that have got that big fat freaking heat sink on the rear. And generally, you, they're the ones you also find with better network connections there on the rear. Ultimately, this point is simply that if you're looking at motherboards to go inside a pre made NAS chassis, a NAS enclosure that just goes stick in your own gubbins, just know that in most, most cases an MITX board um, or a DTX motherboard is what you're going to need so if the if the you know specifications are being too general take my word for it that's the one you're going to find there are some ATX boards out there which as you scale things up they've got more PCIe slots but you'll generally find that they will never fit in those cavities or they won't reach the alignment of that back plane there particularly if there's PCIe slots that you need to factor in but 
These have been the five main areas that people overlook, forget, or cheap out on when going for their own DIY build. I know this has been a long video and I know it's been an enormous info dump. I hope someone watching this has enjoyed this video enough to feel a little bit more confident about buying the components for their first new NAS build. If you need further assistance. There's the free advice section, genuinely free, over at NAS Compares, the big blue button on the right side of all of our pages. Alternatively, there's the Discord. Alternatively, there's the Ask NAS Compares forum. Again, you can reach out to me, reach out to Eddie, it's just us here. And in the description, there are three builds utilizing this case that I've put together for 250, 500, and a little over 750 nicker that you can check out. In the John's Boat N3 build, we're continuing this series while looking at these bigger, pre-built cases and scaling up some of the components we use so do stay tuned for that but apart from that thank you so much for watching i hope you've enjoyed this let me know if you have if you haven't let me know as well why not other than that i'll see you next time